I just can't do it anymore. I have nothing left. Between the divorce, the cancer, your mom dying and being laid off, I know it feels like you're going through a lot. <laughs> Believe me, I have been there. Just remember, when God closes a door, he opens a window. And never forget, God never gives you more than you can handle. Uh, uh, uh. God never said that. Oh, I've got another one if you want to take a shot. Yeah, they come as a pair. Bring it. We want to send a, a very special thank you out to LifeChurch.tv for letting us use that intro video this morning. How many of you guys know that's true? There's so, there's so many times that we uh, we hear things said, or maybe we we even we find ourselves saying things that mm, did God really say that? And it kind of makes its way into our American language, and and so today we're going to kind of uncover some of those mysteries. Um, this is the new series, and and it's really. It's exciting for me because this is something that we've never done before in the history of Mountain Movers Church. This is a mystery series, and the reason it's a mystery is because after today, we will have no idea what we're going to be preaching about. You guys are going to decide. That's right. You guys, the congregation, are going to decide what this series is going to be all about. We're going to allow you the opportunity. You can uh, go on our Facebook page or you can go out to the connecting point and you can just ask some questions that you maybe you don't know the answers to or maybe you would just like to hear Misty and I address those uh, topics here in some upcoming messages. And so we, this is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be fun. Because... We like a challenge. We like a challenge, and we have no clue how this is going to unfold. That's right. So we love doing something different. So if you have a question, you've got a topic in your mind that you're like, I don't ever hear him preach about this. I want to hear about this. You can write it down at the connecting point. There's a there's a basket right there, or go on our Facebook page. That's even easier. Type it in. You can submit as many as you want. We're only going to do this for the next few weeks, so obviously we can't take all of them. But we'll try to take the best questions that would relate to the whole crowd. So today's question is, did God really say that? And a lot of times we hear things that are said and we don't really know if it's in the Word. Let me give you guys some examples. Cleanliness is next to godliness. How many of you guys think that's in the Word? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Wow, our crowd's on it. All right, we're going to unfold that in just a little bit. Uh, God helps those who help themselves. How many of you guys have ever heard that before? Yes? All right, how many of you guys think it's in the Bible? They're scared. Sharp crowd. Or, yeah, maybe they're just they're scared. scared. They're, they're like, I'm they're not scared. raising my hand. They I'm don't want to raise their hand. Okay, all right. That's okay. That's okay. How about love the sinner, hate the sin? Okay, you've heard that? Okay, how about money is the root of all evil? How many of you guys believe that's true? Money is the root of all evil. Okay, all right. We got some sharp people I see in light. the place. We got some sharp people. Okay. Uh, and God won't give you more than you can bear. You guys have heard that one. God won't give you more than you can bear. So we're going to take some of these and, and just, so let's, let's take just a second. All and right, let's, just let's begin. go back. Let's, let's look unpack at them. some of these let things. Me, let me tell you what's the truth about what you just heard, okay? Cleanliness is next to godliness, but it's not in the Word of God. God helps those who help themselves, eh, not in the Word of God. Love the sinner, hate the sin. I've even said that, but I didn't quote it. It's a good thing to say. It's a good thing to do. And it's true. It's not we really should. The Word of God. love Absolutely. people unconditionally, but it's not in the Word. Money is the root of all evil. Now, this one is tricky. Money is the root of all evil. Matthew 6 says the love of money is the root of all evil. We caught a bunch of people in the first crowd. It was fun. Last <laughs> service. It was bad. Everybody was like, yeah, money's evil. That's horrible. Yes, but then we all want it on Friday when that paycheck That's rolls right. on in we so want, we can pay our bills. Bring on the evil, right? It's the love of money. <laughs> and the last one, God won't give you more than you can bear. We've heard it said, but we're going to unpack all today. Right. If you have your word, go to 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. I'm going to tell you why you've heard people say that God won't give you more than you can bear. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, You've heard this scripture maybe before, and it says this. No temptation has ever overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 
This is the scripture where we get a little bit twisted around. But I want you to notice at the beginning, what is God talking about? What is Paul who wrote this? What is he talking about? Temptation. No temptation has ever overtaken you. God is not going to allow you to come under so much temptation that you are not able to bear it. But God never said that he's not going to allow circumstances in your life that you are not able to bear. Now, you're going to have to hang with me. Some of you guys are thinking to yourself, I always thought that they preached God's word, but today I think they are off. And I'm telling you, God never said that. And let me tell you why. You go all throughout the word of God and you go look at patriarchs. Go back and look at the book of Job. And you look at a man who lost all of his children in one day. He lost all of his wealth in one day. He lost his home in one day. You tell me a physical person who's able to bear that much grief in one day. Impossible. Impossible. Look at Noah who was told to build an ark with just him and his boys. When everybody else in the city was mocking and make fun of him. And yet this was an insurmountable thing God was asking him to do. And yet he was able to accomplish it, not in his own strength, but in God's strength. You see, what we do in our mind is we begin to think, God's not going to give me more than I can bear. And the answer to that is, yes, he will. Yes, he will. And we're going to help you today to understand why is that? Why is it that God will give me more than I can bear? Because God wants me to go to him. God wants me to humble myself and go to him. You look at Jesus himself. How many of you guys know Jesus? Every hand should have gone up. All right, no, just kidding. You might be in here and you might not know Jesus, and we're going to tell you about him. Jesus himself came to earth. He was born of a virgin. He lived a life until the age of 33, and then he was in the garden the night before his death praying. He got down on his knees, and as he did, he began to say, God, if there's any way that you can take this cup from me, take it away. Take the cup of suffering. I don't want to go to the cross. This is more than I can bear. He began to sweat so much and so intensely as he's prayed that the sweat became drops of blood, which can be scientifically proven as to why that happened. As Jesus prayed that himself more than one time, but then he followed it up by saying, but God, not my will, but your will be done. He could not have done that in his own strength. And I want you to know, think about this. In the greatest moment of his weakness came the greatest victory of all humanity that we will ever know in this world. All because Jesus was willing to humble himself and do something he could not have done on his own strength. And today, we are the same thing. If you look in Luke chapter 22, verses 42, that's where you'll find that passage. And Jesus says, Father, if you're willing take the cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Go with me to Matthew chapter 11. Love this passage. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, and Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. Pause. Why would he even make this statement? If God was not going to give you more than you can bear, why would he say, come to me, all who are weary? Why are you weary? Because you've got more than you can bear. Because you've got a load so heavy that it's weighting you down. You've got junk going on in your life you can't understand. You don't understand why in the world God would allow you to go through all that you're going through. But Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and carry a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Who's going to give you rest? Jesus. Not within your own strength, because we were not created to bear the weight of this world that we have to. Go on to the next part. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble. I am gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. God is going to give you more than you can bear so that you will go to him. How many times in your life, I want you to think about the roughest thing you've ever gone through in your entire life. For all of us, it might be something different. Some of us, it's losing someone that was so dear to us. Some of us, it was going through a disease. Some of us, maybe it was a divorce. Maybe it was something else, financial. But you've gone through something really hard in your life. How much closer did you get to God during that time of your life? Why? 
Because when things become more than you can possibly bear, you get on your face and you go to the one who can bear it for you. You know, there's been lots of times in, in our lives, just since we've been married, God has taken us through such a journey and such a, such a process. And he's taken us through things that there's, there's, there's no way we would have ever been able to go through those things on our own. The greatest thing is planting this church. I mean, to, when, when he calls you, he qualifies you and he equips you to do what he's called you to do. And it, it's amazing when usually you know when God is speaking to you when, when that thing that he's asking you to do is so much bigger than yourself. And you realize that there's no way that I can do, God, what you're asking me to do. When, when the Lord spoke to Abraham and he said, I want you to, to sacrifice your son, Isaac. There's no way. There is no way that Abraham in his own strength would have been able to do that. But he was empowered by God's presence up until the moment to where he literally was about to thrust the knife through his son and sacrifice him out of obedience. And, and when we were planting this church, you know, most people, when they, look at our, when, they, when they would look at us and see a couple with no money and... <laughs> One couple in a mobile home in the middle of a field with no money. Just, did I say no money? No money. Did I mention that? There's no money. No resources. Nothing. Start with nothing. And then, and then the Lord provides. You know, the Lord brings a storm to demolish our van and, and a shed and some different things so we could get the insurance money to, to overhaul this little house. And I want to tell you the lot of the work that went into that house was, if, if you want to call it work, it was me literally just, I, there was a night, I'm telling you guys, I had a breakdown. I was screaming at God at the top of my lungs saying, God, I don't, I'm not a carpenter, right? I'm not an electrician. I'm not a plumber. I have no clue what I'm doing here. I was so miserable and so, do you remember that night? I was so frustrated because here I am. I felt like I was all alone, all by myself, no skills to do what I was doing. And, and, and I just, I, I came to this breaking point where I just said, God, I cannot do this. I can't do this. I can't, I can't remodel a building. I don't know what I'm doing. And we don't hardly have what we need to do it. And it's, and it's like the Lord just said, good, get out of the way. If you haven't noticed yet, I don't really need you. <laughs> I kind of did the world up to this point without you. Kind of created the, you know, did creation thing in six days. You know, I don't really need you a whole bunch. Just be obedient because I'm, I'm using you, but I don't need you, right? And so the Lord cultivated our relationship with him and our leadership through that whole process and allowed us to do something that we couldn't do. What was on us was something that we were incapable of doing within ourselves. And now to see, you know, to see the, the, the new addition in this building and to see, man, guys, Wednesday nights is out of control. It's awesome. You know, the Lord has caused us to go to two services uh, back in the spring, and the house is full. And Wednesday nights we had, how many do we have? Newcomers. That 32 newcomers in that classroom and it's packed out for our newcomers life group uh, brandy's life group is packed kim's uh, kids uh, kids explosion is packed and and right now we're trying to if you guys aren't aware of the expansion project that we're doing we are believing god for the finances just to begin to build these life rooms we need some built within a month we need at least one room built within in about five weeks we need a room built so we can split these life groups up and, 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 and create more life groups. It's just out of control. And you know the best part of it is I have nothing to do with it. Because it's, it's greater and it's bigger than ourselves. And God wants to do something in your life that is so much bigger than you. So much bigger than you. So he will put things on your plate. He will create a load for you and allow you to experience a load that is so heavy that you have absolutely no choice but to depend on him. A saying, it's not in the scriptures, but it is saying 
that I tell people a lot, and that is God will allow you to have to fall flat on your back so that the only way you can look is up. He will allow you to get so broken down and beat down and, and almost destroyed to where you have got to eventually just lay down and give up and let God be God in your life. I have a very dear friend of mine that was a church planter as well. They started in, um, in their home in a Bible study, and they worked so hard to try to build this church, and it just wasn't happening. And he finally had a breakdown moment, much like the one that I had. And he said, God, I'm just going to sit here like a bump on a log until you do something. And he said, God literally spoke to him. And he said, it's about time. It's about time. And when I was visiting that church, they were already, they already had a, over a thousand people. And he said, this isn't us. We have nothing to do with this. The Bible says, unless the Lord build the house, the laborers who build it, they labor in vain. This is about a God thing. What God is doing at this church right now is a, is a God thing. People's lives are being changed. People are, are being saved and receiving Christ every single week. And it's so much bigger than us. Some of you guys lately, I'm sure, have gone, as I look across this congregation, I know what's going on in your lives. I know that you are going through some stuff. I want to direct your attention to James chapter 1. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Now, doesn't that sound ironic? A lot of times we convince ourselves that, man, when everything is going great, God is good. That is a lie. It has nothing to do with anything. God is good regardless of what's going on in your life. God is good every single day that you wake up. God is good. Every time you go to maybe write a check and your bank account is overdrawn, God is still good. Every time you look in the mirror and all you can see is guilt and shame and brokenness, God is good. It doesn't have to do with your circumstances. It has to do with who he is and what he's done on the cross and what he offers you in your life each and every day. Your joy does not come from what is happening in your life. Your joy comes from who Jesus is in your life. So consider it an opportunity for great joy. Why? Because God is wanting to stretch you. He's wanting to strengthen you in your life. How many of you guys have ever lift weights, lifted weights before? Okay, so, so you know that it's really, really important after you've lifted weights to stretch. After your body gets warm, you want to stretch those muscles, especially if you're wanting those muscles to grow, right? When you work out so hard and then you stretch, you're literally enlarging those muscles. So the next time you go to work out, your muscles can get bigger. So that means you can get stronger. God wants to stretch you in your life. He wants, he wants to allow you to have to endure basic hell in your life. Why? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. When your faith is tested. What does that mean? What does that mean? Faith, what is faith? It's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that are not seen. Faith is sitting in the chair. We've done an entire message on this, and I want you to go back and get it if you have a chance. But it's basically just sitting there in your circumstances and realizing that you can't do it. So faith is sitting. That's right. 
when all of this hell is happening all around your life, what do you want to do? You want to react. What am I going to do? Oh, God, I've got to go get an extra job. Oh, we're going to have to get marriage counseling. Uh, I, I'm, I've got to go to the doctor because I, I, I've got, and you go down the list and you start trying to fix things. And, and, and to an extent, that's okay. But for the most part, you just need to sit down in faith. Without faith, without sitting in confidence that God can handle every situation that you're dealing with, without having faith, it's impossible to please God, the Bible says. God wants you to sit down in total and complete confidence and in security that says, God, with an attitude that says, God, I know you can do this. And, And even if it doesn't turn out the way I want it to, who am I? Last time I gave God my opinion as to how I thought things should be, there was an awkward silence. And then, really? That's how God talks to me. Who am I? Who am I? He hung the stars where they rest. He's named the planets. He has every hair on your head numbered. That doesn't mean he knows how, only how many hairs are on your head. It means that each hair has... Don't do it. I'm already lacking in this region. They have a number. They actually have, they a, have a number. They have a number. How each cool hair has a number. And the Bible says that his thoughts for you are as many as the grains of sand on the seashore. He thinks about you that much. God's a creepy God. He thinks about you while you're sleeping, and he watches you at night. He's He's a creepy God. He loves you that much. So to say, oh, he'll never give me more than I can. Hogwash! It's not true. It's not true. Punch the person who tells you that next time. Right in the face. Think of all the things that you've gone through in your life as a believer and imagine going through those things without the Lord and you're telling me you can handle it? You're that good? You're that good you can handle it? No, you can't handle it. As pastors, we have to do funerals often. And when we attend a funeral or officiate a a, a funeral that is just loaded with people who don't know Christ, You could cut the air because it's thick with hopelessness. It's thick with depression. It's thick with a hurt that has no remedy because they don't know this. Yeah, when we lose somebody, we hurt. Of course we grieve. It's natural. God gave us emotions. But there's a difference when as a believer you lose somebody and a non-believer who literally has no hope for anything. No hope. And so then, as non-believers, we see them striving for things that will give them some sense of happiness and strength and security and fulfillment. So if it's a good day, wow, awesome. Woo. When it's a bad day, hopelessness, depression, anger, and it goes on and on and on and on. Does God give you more than you can bear? Absolutely he does. Sit in the chair. Sit there and let God be God. For when you know what, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. We are to strive every single day to grow, to get better. But God allows us to go through those opportunities to stretch us. Because some of us, if not given that opportunity, we would never, ever, ever grow. Because we wouldn't choose ourselves to just get up and grow. So God says, you know, I'm just going to push you just a little bit. I'm going to make you depend on me just a little bit. 
And as you do, when you begin to really study this passage, this passage I could preach for weeks. I took a 16-week college class on this book, and there's only five chapters. That means it is so rich and so full. But when you really study this, what it's literally talking about, when it says troubles of any kind, it's talking about many different kinds of circumstances. God's going to give you lots of different types of circumstances so that each and every time you face these hard times, you remember the last time you went through something. And you can say, you know what? God met me there in that little tiny thing. I remember, let me tell you just in a little tiny one. My kids, when they were little, they wanted a boat. Who cares if we had a boat, right? Our kids cared that we had a boat. And Brad told them one time, he said, hey, a boat's not a priority. We're planting a church. And they said, we want a boat. Everybody else has a boat. And we would drive by the marina, and they would say, can't we just go get one? We're like, that's stealing. We're planting a church, not planning to go to hell. No, we're not getting a boat. And so one day he said, just pray. You want a boat? Just pray. Just ask God for a boat. And we're kind of like flippantly like, ask God for a boat, right? We didn't even have a truck. What would we pull a boat with? We had a minivan. No joke, a minivan. And so one Because somebody day, said, I will never drive a minivan. Yes, so we drive one twice. So one you day, just keep your mouth somebody shut. calls up Brad. I've been told that more than once in my life. Somebody calls up Brad and says, hey, I've got this boat that I'm thinking about selling. But when I got ready to put it out there for sale, I thought of you and your family. And I think God wants me to give you this boat. And we're thinking, what kind of boat is somebody going to give us but a big pile, right? I mean, it's just going to be a piece of junk. And not only is Brad not a carpenter, we know nothing about I don't know how to drive a boat. anything, nor driving a boat. Too busy working to and figure so, out stuff like building and boating. So Brad said, what do you do when somebody wants to give you something? You graciously say, yeah, sure, we'd love to have a boat. So the guy brings over the boat, right? He says, I'll bring it over on this certain day. And he pulls in, and we're boat. in the house. And Brad's like looking out the window, and his eyes got huge. And I said, is it a big pile? I'm like, oh, my oh. word. What is it? What is it? You know, we're going to have to park it behind the trailer. Holy cow, this is bad. And so Brad goes, look outside. And it was a, like, I don't even know how big. I think it was 24 feet. Like 24-foot deck boat. Is that right? Where, like, we could have had, like, 14 people on the party barge thing. We're like. It was a deck boat. Oh, my word. It was a deck boat. I said that. Yeah, it was cool. It was a deck boat. And so our kids come flying out the door. They do. And they're like, God, oh, answer my prayers. God, oh, prayers. We got a boat. Oh, boat. And I'm just like, oh. oh, my word. Now, we, we don't have that boat anymore. But I'll tell you what's amazing about that story. We took it out a few times, and it needed a mechanic on board most of the time. Not so me. that wasn't us. So we had to Not call me. out for rescues more than once. But... The amazing thing is, when we got ready to buy our home, God allowed us to sell that boat, and that boat brought enough money to be the down payment of the new home that we bought. Now, you tell me that God doesn't know your exact circumstances, that he doesn't care, and that he doesn't hear you right where you are. He does, but he'll allow you to get pressed into these situations where you have nothing else to do but just say, God, it's in your hands. I'm going to sit right here. I'm going to sit right here, and I'm not going to do anything else but just trust you. Because when you begin to see, consider it an opportunity for great joy, you're not getting excited because you're going through hard times, okay? That's retarded. You don't get excited because you go through hard times. You get excited, and you take joy because God is still in control. Right. So what's the worst thing that's going to happen in this situation? Maybe I'm going to die. That's what I look at. Maybe in the worst situation I would die, and guess what? That would be the greatest promotion I've ever had in my life because I would be in heaven for all eternity with no more frustration, no more stress. And so what we have to look at in our life is begin to realize everything you're going through, God is giving you an opportunity to grow. So when bad things happen, just last night, we've had, our family has had a really rough week. It's funny when we go to preach things like this, how we go through it before we preach it for you. It's not fun. God but wants us to have fresh material. He does. It's good stuff. So I'm not even going to tell you all the junk we've gone through, but let me just tell you one. Last night, as we were out tending to some very sick dogs that we have on our property, we're out there and everything is very stressful. We had headlights and cell phone lamps 
in the dark trying to finish things up. And I had drove the Highlander, which is Brad's vehicle, around to shine the lights for the kids. And when all of it was done, and everybody comes in, and it's like 10.30 or 11, and we're coming in to finally eat dinner, Brad comes in through the front door, and he says, who drove the Highlander around to the back? Now, you're thinking, you guys don't even have kids with driver's license. It's okay. All of them drive. So he says. When there's as much work to do around our place. Not on the highway. Just teach them to drive. But they drive on the dirt roads. And, and so he said, who drove the Highlander around? And I said, I did. Why? He said, got a complete flat. And I'm like, oh, wow. I said, somebody must have ran over a nail. I'm like, you know tire. you're going to have to change that, yeah. right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. And on top of everything <laughs> else. I can change a flat tire. Okay, I'm, like, I'm not that I'll bad. I'll call it AA or whatever that group is. AA. I don't know. <laughs> what is it? The one that changes That's, your tire? They, they'll, they'll, they'll come around you and they'll, they'll <laughs> say, for older people? hi, Misty. No, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. I might need and that. <laughs> you need a support group for your flat tire. Oh. Welcome to my life, <laughs> right here. I'm calling it because I got a flat need. tire. But you know what begins to happen? And the world says it like this: when it rains, it pours. I know he messed up my hair, didn't he? Sorry. When it rains, and just this week we talked to a girl, and she's going through a lot. And you know what her answer to us was? She said, "I'm going to drink a lot tonight." Yeah. And we said, "Don't do that! Don't do that!" And she said, "That's what I'm going to do because how else am I going to deal with what's going on in my life?" That's my point. And we were like, no, saying. man, no. no man, God will help you. Turn to God. Give it to God. Because God will surround you with his peace. When you're in those circumstances and it just feels like you can't take any more, you're at your breaking point, you get on your face, and you just begin to go before God, and you just begin to let it all out. And you'll begin to be surrounded with such an incredible and overwhelming peace. And such an overwhelming amount of God's presence that God will rejuvenate you and you'll be able to say, I can go another day. There was a story that I heard the other day. And it, 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 it goes something like this. There was a, a, a father and a son and they were, they were going through some circumstances in their life and basically they were going through some really, really hard times and he was a pastor. It was a pastor's family. They were missionaries, and they were coming home. And as they were flying home on the plane, uh, apparently there was a celebrity that was on the plane with them. And when they got off the plane, the, the crowds just, just began to just, they were taking pictures, and they were yelling and hooping and hollering for this celebrity and going on and on and on. And really, the celebrity had done nothing, really had really done no, no great contribution to society. But the, this missionary family had sacrificed everything. They had been persecuted, and they were, they were poor, and they were broken, and, and just given everything for the gospel of Christ. And they came home, and, and the son said, Dad, why, why isn't anybody? We've given all. And nobody's taking our pictures. Nobody's thanking us. Nobody wants our autographs for everything that we've done for these hurting, hopeless people. Why, Dad? And, and, the, and the pastor, the missionary, says to his son, he said, Son, he said, we're not home yet. This place isn't our home. We, we, don't, we aren't driven by accomplishment and reward and the accolades given to us by men that's not why we do what we do when we get to heaven guys there's going to be a celebration like you cannot even begin to imagine the things that God has in store for us your mind cannot even begin to comprehend what heaven will look like what it will be like, what it will smell like, what it will feel like. We're not home. Where we are right now is just on assignment in a foreign land with a mission to lead people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that is continuing. Storms are going to come. 
And when all of the wind has cleared and you wake up the next morning and there's debris in your life everywhere all around you, it is those of us who can glorify God with hands lifted high and say, God, thank you so much for the storm. Thank you for making an example of me that as unbelievers look at my life and they see me unchanged, steady as a rock, immovable, even through the midst of the storm, still having joy, still having hope, still having peace that no man can take away and driving them to jealousy because it seems like in my life everything is falling apart, but yet I'm still complete. Only a great and gracious God can do something like that. So he must be real. What are they holding on to? What are they clinging to? What? How can they be so strong when it seems like they should be so weak. Second Corinthians 12 and 9 says, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Don't you understand that when you are at your weakest point, God is the strongest. And when you feel like all hope is lost, you feel broken and you feel empty and there's nothing left, God is just getting started in your life not only is he able he is willing and he is ready he is excited and he has great anticipation to move in your life because it's not about you it's all about him that we would decrease that we would be brought down to nothing in our lives so that he can increase inside of us and people don't even recognize who you are because of who he is inside of you. He wants to be seen, and he wants you to disappear. The world needs to see Jesus. We have nothing to offer. They need to see him and him alone. So you see, God does give us more than we can bear, and it's so beautiful. It's so wonderful. And God wants you to come to a place where you say, God, thank you so much. Because I can't do this. Who's in this place today? You would stand up right now and say, I'm, I'm at a place right now. I can't do this. And I just need God to meet me right where I'm at. Is there anybody in this house who would just stand up right now and just say, I need God. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Anybody else, you need God to move right now. You say, I want God to just meet me where I'm at. I, I, am, I am asking God to move through my life in a mighty way. I want to pray with you this morning. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond what we can imagine, ask for, or even think. Use the storm, God. To stimulate the attention of those who are watching us, those who see our lives and might even be questioning your existence, Father God. I pray right now, Lord, even in the midst of the storm, I pray 
that the peace that surpasses all understanding would guard the hearts and the minds of those who will call upon your name right now like a mighty garrison a stronghold a fortress surrounded by soldiers strengthen and bring peace to those who are calling out to you now father god help them to have joy help them to have peace help them to have hope when it seems like all hope should be lost strengthen them now father god and in them father god let their weakness father god be replaced by your strength and perfect in them an endurance father that will allow them to run the race and never ever ever quit And as heads are bowed this morning and eyes are closed, I want to know who would be in this place this morning and you would be honest with me and say, Pastor Brad, you talk about heaven. And I'm not so sure that heaven is my home. I'm not so sure that if I were to leave this world today that I would have heaven as my home. But I want that relationship to be made secure right now. I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I, I, I want to offer an invitation for you to have a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that is contagious. This is the opportunity of a lifetime for God to cleanse your heart, for you to call upon His name, for you to invite him as Lord and King of your life and to make heaven your home. If you want to make that decision today, you might be watching online and you're included in this. You just say, Pastor Brad, I need Jesus. I want heaven as my home. I'm gonna count to three and when I do, I want you to raise your hand so I know who I'm praying with today. Are you ready? to discover life, the decision of a lifetime. Here we go, one, two, life change on three, three. Raise your hand. Amen. Life change. I wanna pray with you today if you would repeat this prayer with me and if the house would pray in agreement in support of those making this life-changing decision today father i love you i thank you for jesus i know that i have fallen short of the glory of god forgive me of the things i've said forgive me of my thoughts forgive me of the things i've done Wipe the sin from my heart now. Cleanse me. Renew me. Jesus, come into my heart. I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are Lord. And the only way for me to make heaven is to have you as Lord of my life. I dedicate from this moment forward that I'm going to live for you. Surround me with the right people. Give me the right habits. Move mountains out of my life so I can see the destiny that you've given me. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Give a hand to those who have received Christ this morning. This morning before we close out, we're gonna pray over a little baby that's not in this room. Little Rhett is Mitch and Lindsay's baby that was born on Tuesday. If you guys were here last week, you heard Mitch's testimony and you heard about the baby that was going to be born on Tuesday. Little Rhett was born and he's in the NIC unit, but today he's having a little bit of a rough time. He's
been having a hard time eating enough, and yesterday they discovered that he has a small hole in his heart. And this is just one of those storms in life that we just preached about. But this morning, we're going to pray for Baby Red, and we're going to pray. Lindsay's there with him now, and Mitch is here doing what God has called him to do. And I know you've never walked in those shoes. That's a hard thing to keep walking in the calling God's called you when you want to be there. So we're going to pray for Baby Red this morning, if you guys will bow your heads. Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, God, that you are a God who is a healer. God, you are a miracle-giving God. Lord, we know, Father God, that you gave this child to Mitch and Lindsay. Father God, they weren't able to have babies, the doctor said, and you gave them this little boy into their life. God, I pray right now, God, that you would touch his little body. God, his little four-pound body, I pray, God, that he would begin to eat the way he needs to eat. I pray, God, that you would seal the hole that the doctors say is in his heart. I pray, God, that this little miracle baby would win souls for you. God, as he lays there in that hospital and as Mitch and Lindsay and their family witness to the nurses and witness to the doctors, God, I pray that they would lead people into a real and life-changing relationship as they see the miracle in front of them. God, I pray that you would surround Mitch and Lindsay with peace, God, as they sit in the chair in faith believing, God, that you are in control. God, we, we take joy in knowing, God, that little red is in your hands. You are in control, God. Lord, we thank you. God, we thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, give to our ministry. We've made giving easy here at Mount Movers Church. If you have your smartphone, just text the number 918-223-8090. Just push in the amount you want to give and push send. It's that easy. If you don't have your smartphone, not a problem. You can mail your giving just as easy to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. Thanks for watching today. Hey, remember, we're dreaming big for you. We'll see you next week.